Thanks for having us again, Robert. Um, we kind of have taken over. So I'm, I promised to talk a little bit differently about some of the stuff that CFWEP does, um, aside from breeze and aside from the beaver mimicry that you guys had a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to talk about actually um, our program that we do in the schools, from Butte all the way to Missoula, all the way up to, I think, Helmville and Olvando are our farthest reach that way. So. Um, <coughs> And we did have the opportunity to present this uh, information and have a paper published on this actually um, in Hawaii this last June. Darn, I had to go to Hawaii. Um, so I'm going to talk about environmental education in one of the largest Superfund sites in America. And I would, I would say we're the largest, but we'll get to that. So just a quick overview, we're going to go through uh, the Upper Clark Fork watershed, kind of orient everybody to where we're at. We're going to talk about Superfund, CFWEP, and then finally our Restoration Education Program, or we call it REP. So I, I'm just going to orient you guys where we're at. I know you know where we're at, but I also took some of these slides from some of our curriculum for our seventh graders. So just so you guys kind of get a feel of what it is we're presenting to the kids and how we help them understand things. So here's the United States, right? There's our lovely state of Montana. We're going to zoom in to that little green area. And that's our upper Clark Fork watershed. And so we're going to zoom again and again, right? And so this whole green area is our upper Clark Fork watershed, right? And so we start this whole thing off here in Butte with Silver Bow Creek, the headwaters um, ish, right? Blacktail is actually contributing the flow. But, and then this joins into the Clark Fork and carries all the way down through to Milltown, OK? So. These are, I always, I love Butte history. I, I found that that's the other thing I wanted to be when I grew up is I wanted to be a historian outside of being a wildlife biologist. So I always like to start off talking about some of the Butte history and kind of what we looked like. And we do this a lot with the kids because we want them to know where we came from. And we're getting into this generation of kids where the seventh graders are, they, we ask what year they were born and they're like 2003. Excuse me? Wait, what? No. So none of them have a clue. You take them outside and they're like, this was all mine waste up here. And they're like, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. So we like to start them off with showing some of these historical photos to them um, and just kind of orienting them. So OK, this would be if we're looking uptown. Notice, right, all the beautiful mine waste piles. Just beautiful, right? Oh, and you live right next door to that. That's your backyard. Beautiful, not a blade of grass, right? Um, this is Silver Row Creek, okay, where the parrot smelter, so this is tailings on the creek here, right, somebody sampling for the Humagone trial. Um, more reduction works, um, early 1900s. This is the neighborhoods of McQueen and Meterville, which this one is again one that kids have never heard of. How many of you guys have heard of McQueen and Meterville? Okay, most of you guys. Whew. Most kids are like, what? Not a clue again. So this is the future site of the Berkeley Pit in the early 1950s. Berkeley Pit would eventually take over this whole area. Um, and then some more recent ones. This is along that Bernie's Way. There's the diamond. Um, the current mine property, kind of an overcast day. The Berkeley Pit. Uh, this is mine tailings in the soil. Some more Silver Bow Creek. This is the Colorado. Um, this is Silver Bow Creek at Whiskey Gulch prior to the restoration. And so we like to show a lot of these before pictures and show durings and then show after. Again, show them where we've come from because they don't understand a lot of the work that we, that's we that gone on here. Um, and so this is actually at Grant Coors. So this is on the Clark Fork River Bank. And so hopefully, these guys have been slated for the last couple years. Hopefully, hopefully this summer they'll get going on that. Um, this is Clark Fork floodplain. This one is getting, this one here, this Slickens pile is getting a little bit bigger even. I saw it this last summer. That one's beautiful, isn't it? The kids, we showed this one to the kids and we're like, what do you think that is? And we're like, snow, I don't know. Does snow eat plants away? Mm -hmm. No, no. This one takes them a minute. Um, so how, how did we get to be a super fun site? What, what led to our listing? And so the first is that Silver Bow Creek here in Butte and actually Warm Springs in Anaconda, they were used to actually dump tailings into, right, to wash it away down the creek. Now, we always talk to them too about how it's not that the miners were being, you know, 
really rotten. They weren't trying to do all of this stuff. They thought their actual motto was the solution to pollution is dilution. It rhymes, so it must work, right? So they, they actually thought what they were doing was diluting the mine waste and not creating a problem. But we talked to the kids a lot more about how, well, we do have a sulfide ore body, so we have iron pyrite combining with air and water, and that creates sulfuric acid and rust. So we're, we actually extrapolated the problem. Um, the other thing that happened, so going back one, this thing barely works. Going back one, um, the other thing that would happen is that the tailings would drop out pretty much within like the first, first stretch of the creek. Okay, so everything would pile up here in the Butte area. And then we had a really heavy snow year, 1907, 1908, with a long rain season. And we had the biggest flood on the Clark Fork watershed on our record, okay? So there was the flood of 1908, and you can see, right, the flood waters rushing past. Um, William Clark had just finished building this dam in the fall of 1907. He was a little upset. So he brought some of his miners down to actually blow up the dam portion to save the powerhouse because that was like the bread and butter. So um, this led to this. Um, and I love this picture because I feel like it speaks volumes to the kids, um, talking about how this sat this way for 100 years. What's missing from this floodplain, right? The grass, OK? So we talk a lot about how this stuff takes a long time. You know, right? Nature would take a long time to rehab itself and to restore itself and to get better from this, OK? So this all led to our watershed today. And so here we are. We are one of the largest complexes of Superfund sites in the country. Um, we are probably the most complex. If I mean, a lot of you guys are familiar with this, right? Um, and we'll get into that in one sec. We are also the longest lasting. We were first listed in 1983, so now we're 34 years old. Um, so here's our, right, orienting our mega Superfund sites. And I don't know if you guys have ever read the documentation too. It actually says mega Superfund sites. Mm -hmm. I looked into it because I was like, that's not technical. I didn't make that one up. So uh, first we have our Butte Silverbow <coughs> Creek area. And again, just in this monster, we have like 17 operable units. Not all of them have a rod. Not all of them have a consent decree. A lot of them still have some problems, OK? So lots of stuff to do. If you're looking for a career in this, I don't know if Robert's told you this. If you're looking for a career in this, yes, perfect. Um, then we also have the Anaconda Smelter Hill. And then we carry on with our stretch of the Clark Fork. So it's about 120 river miles. So it's large. Um, and then it takes us 20 minutes to explain our name. Perfect, right? Except for you don't know what a watershed is yet. We're going to get there. Okay, so we are the Clark Fork ed ed Watershed Education Program, or CFWEP for short. Okay, so this is what it looks like to have CFWEP in your classroom. Um, we like to do all sorts of activities, hands on, minds on, anything with them. So this is an activity actually showing them the steps of mining. So how do we go from these big, huge rocks to fine grains, right? Really fine grains, okay? So we kind of walk them through that. Um, we take them out in the field and we show them the aquatic macros in the creek, which is crazy. They think it's the best thing ever. Um, this is another program we do. It's called Bringing Research into the Classroom, which Chris might have talked about a little bit. Brick, he's the field coordinator for that. Um, so we travel all, all over the state for this one as well. Um, get them outside. Get them in their communities. This is a day at Father Sheehan Park that we do every year. Um, building riparian habitat models. Getting them to actually think about what a riparian habitat is. Uh, getting to bail the blue water from GS Well 41 down by the Copper or down by the Civic Center, which this one is always a lot of fun, and we usually get to do this every year with the high schoolers as well. And if you haven't gotten to do it, go do it. It's sweet. Make sure you bring some some nails or some paper clips that'll plate out the copper for you. Okay. Um, this is a group we um, had from Iraq. We get these guys every year as well, so we get to work a lot with international groups. Um, we've done a lot of tours recently with um, folks from Israel, Mongolia, Russia, Ukraine. Like I said, we get the Iraqis every year, um, so we like to do this to them because they are they are like usually just dressed perfectly, and we like to bring them out to the river and show them the bugs. Um, this is our Clean Up Blacktail Stream Day. So this is an event we do annually as well. We're always looking for volunteers. I'll get into that again. Um, but again, reacquainting kids to, hey, this creek runs through Butte. 
And we get to do a fly fishing camp every year. And poor Tommy didn't catch a fish for like the first three years and he finally caught one. <laughs> so, but this, this is a lot of fun. We have a ton of fun getting to actually go to the hatchery, getting to teach them how to fly fish, tie their own flies, do fish dissections, tons and tons of fun. So, uh, annually, we usually serve about two to 4,000 students. This year, I don't know what happened, but somehow we're at 8,000 students, and I'm done. Yeah, we're tired. <laughs> I'm glad it's November. Um, and so, as of this November 1st, we actually hit over 40,000 students, which is pretty cool that we've seen that many kids in the last 10 years. We've been operating since for 10 years now, so that's pretty sweet. Um, on our end, so I, I do have another one of me in Missoula, I should say. There's another field coordinator over there who handles all of the Missoula schools. Thank God, because I don't know how we do that. But, um, so on our end, we range all the way from Butte all the way up to Bonner. Um, and like I said, we do hit Lincoln, Ovando. We hit all of our Blackfoot schools usually with trout dissections. So we get to see them, and then we usually get to see them with watershed days with the Blackfoot Challenge, other different activities as well. And then the school, the ones with the schoolhouses, that's where we do this five-day restoration education program with. Okay, so pretty much all of our local seventh graders see this. So every kid in Butte, right, which they should be seeing it, um, and all the way up. So when we start with the kids, we start with a slide like this exact slide, actually. And we start out by telling them, you know, we got to make them relate to this. Because otherwise, they're just going to be like, why is she telling us the history of this? They don't get it, right? So we start out by telling them, okay, well, this is our story, all of our story, okay? And so our story is pretty complex, and it has four major players, I would say. So there's science, human history, laws and policy, and then also what's happening now in our communities. And then within these, there's lots of layers, right? And it gets more complex. Okay, so we talk about how we cover all of these sciences, and then we also make sure we cover what these words mean. Right, because some of them are fifth, some of them are seventh. They might not have a clue what we're talking about with chemistry. A lot of them don't know that chemistry has a lot to do with water when we're talking about watershed science. So that's kind of cool. Um, human history, this is where I come in, right? All of the major eras. Uh, we talk about the clean air, clean water, and toxic waste or super fund, all the laws that came into play. And then also, what are we doing now? So the cleanups that we have, the restoration, remediation, standing up for our rights, and then also moving into kind of health and well-being of this. So that's complicated, right? How do you cover all of this with four days in the classroom and one day for a field trip? We don't know. We, sometimes we don't know. Okay, so we do it this way. Um, it's our rep program, and so we do a lot of place-based education, minds-on and hands-on, which I'll explain, and then the framework for NGSS, or the Next Generation Science Standards. And this picture encompasses all of those things. So we take the kids out to their backyards, right? The creeks are running through their backyards, maybe, or they can get to it. A lot of this is, all of this is public access, so they can get to this stuff one way or another, okay? That's the great thing about our Superfund. So we make sure that they get outside, we bring it to them, we tell them you can come here anytime with your parents, and then we make sure that they have something hands-on to do, right? Maybe they're collecting data on water quality. We'll get, I'll kind of explain more of that in a minute. Um, and we also make them think about it. What do these things mean? Like if you're collecting water quality, what does it mean if, what does the turbidity mean? What do these values mean? Start thinking about it. And then this kind of sets up all of the framework for NGSS. Okay, it all kind of comes in together and melds. So this is a CFWP's mission statement. I don't know if you guys have seen this in the other presentations or not, um, but it's to foster environmental stewardship and scientific decision-making through place-based learning and direct experiences. That's the biggest thing we do. That's why we get tired, probably, is because we do direct experiences. So. Um, what do our four days in the classroom look like? Well, we talk about, these are the main themes behind them. So we talk about what is a watershed, the history of our watershed, mining, both historical and current, because they are, we're doing different things, right? Historical waste was taken off site, but now no waste leaves MR complexes. And that's a big thing for kids, I think, to realize, is that the mining practices have changed a lot. Um, we talk about riparian habitats, and then we also talk about the two types of cleanup. 
and then we take them outside. So after we cover all of that, right, in four days we take them outside to the river. And so we talk about, okay, look at these guys live in the water. What kinds do we have? Okay, kind of do a little bit of taxonomy with them. Um, let them look close up, let them pick them up, touch them, right? Cause we can't really hurt them as long as we're gentle. Um, so let them look at that. We let them collect water quality. And then we also assess the riparian vegetation. And so we put all of those puzzle pieces together and we're actually doing an investigation with them. And so our current question has been, is the cleanup working? Okay, and so we want them, we want to make it a question that's current, right? So that they can actually pick it up and say, oh yeah, okay, well, is it working or is it not working? Currently, I think the consensus is yes, the stretch of Silver Oak Creek that we're on. Oh, and some more, I'm not sure what I'm explaining. <coughs> Something about a plant. And then another part that we do later on in the day is we actually take them to Foreman's Park, um, where the Mountain Consolidated Mine Yard is. And so we take them up there because, again, I can't get off my history soapbox and I have to talk about it. And then the other thing is that Foreman's Park is a great vantage point for talking about remediation. So it's awesome to get to go up there and say, okay, if you look across this way, all of this green is a mine cap. And you start to explain how it works and it's, it's great. The kids really pick it up. So, um, like I said, we did start to evaluate, is this working? Because we're entering into 10 years. Um, we're funded by Natural Resource Damage Program. So we get curious, are we being effective? Are, you know, we're talking all the time, we're visiting all these students, is this working? So we had about a 30% knowledge gain from pre to post test. We do a pre-test um, about a week before we come into the classroom and then a post test within the, uh, the last week before we're gone after the field trip. Okay, and so we, do, we did see a 30% gain there, which hopefully, unless they're sleeping the whole time. Um, we also saw a strong gain of positive attitudes toward the environment, which is, which is nice. And then also a positive gain, not as strong, um, towards sciences, which is great. There's some misconceptions there that we've gotten into that are kind of funny. One of the questions that for the longest time we couldn't figure out how they were missing it, one of the questions was, do you enjoy working with scientists? And they were like, no. And they would answer it on the post test too. And we were like, oh my God, are you serious? They don't like us? It well, was it, worse after. Our it meeting. was worse after because we were just like, oh my God. But what came out is that they didn't know we were scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. They just think like we were goofballs coming in like, hey, and I guess we don't act professional enough. I don't know. So we had to start like introducing ourselves as scientists and being like, hey, do you guys believe we're scientists? And Because one day we asked the kids, we were like, well, draw, draw what a scientist is. And they drew like Albert Einstein in a lab coat and beakers and it's like, oh boy, we have ways to go. So that was, we kind of cleared that one up recently. So um, we also do this thing, uh, three, two, one exit surveys, and so we, we want their feedback all the time. It's kind of valid, instant gratification for us, hopefully. Um, and so we get things like this. My favorite thing was getting to learn about what's going on around me and my environment, right? These are from kids, you can tell. I did not spell check this. Um, also, you know, my favorite thing was going outside and learning. A lot of kids, I don't know what it is. Certain schools, especially that we work with, like Webster Garfield will work with, they don't go outside a ton sometimes. I mean, unless they're getting in trouble sometimes. A lot of those kids are good though. Um, this one was pretty cool too. I want to become an environmental scientist because of you guys. So that's, that's like the instant gratification. Yes, we're doing good. Keeps us going. Um, we started going to this minds on hands on thing, right? So not just thinking about it, but also tying in the hands as well so that they're, we're accessing all three learning channels, right? There's visual, auditory, and then kinesthetic. So if we're exercising all three of those, hopefully, hopefully they're picking up what we're saying. Um, and so we constantly challenge ourselves. We're constantly, I would say we're constantly reviewing our curriculum now. We just underwent a major curriculum overhaul and we're doing it all again because it's just not good enough. Um, so there's always opportunities for improvement and we base a lot of this on what we see from the pre and post tests. So, <laughs> You guys are experiencing me after the end of a fall field season, so I'm kind of brain dead. So this is what you, you end up with stuff like this on a slide, sorry. But I'm gonna have you guys run through one of the ex exercises that we do with our kids. So what we start with 
is this is what we start with first day. So we explain that yes, we are in fact scientists. We're not just screwballs that your teacher brought in. And then we say, okay, watershed. <coughs> what is that? And sometimes the kids are like, oh, I know. And we're like, no, no, keep it to yourselves. So you tell us. And I want you guys to do this because we have the time. I built it in. I want you to take five minutes and I want you to draw what a watershed is. And then, because we're good scientists, I also want you to label your watershed's features because Rick might draw a tree and he's thinking it's a tree and I'll say, that's a fish. It looks like a fish to me. So you must label. Okay, so I'll give you five minutes and then I'm gonna walk around and we'll, this is real experience of the classroom. <laughs> and then I can get, this is where I get a drink of water usually and stop talking for a sec. You can use the whiteboard. No marker. Man. Oh, wait. You're in luck. <laughs> Bill's going to draw it first on the board. Very nice. I know, because we have too much to talk about. Also because we have to just connect the field trips. I know, it's just too hard. Are you guys still doing, looking at the Colts thing that, you know, we did with the people in Seattle? This looks like it is ramped up to it's, university level with field to bill what they're interested in. It's hand in hand with it. I would say with CFAGE is coming on, it is, and actually Dr. Graff teaches a lot of the way Pulse does, um, where it's flipped classrooms. So I would say it's coming in, but that was, oh, that, in, this, this school. in tech or in, yeah, Dr. Graff is doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's helping us with doing with CFAGES with Pulse. So yeah, yeah. What's the education program that was running in 2006 in Missoula. It's not CPWEP, it was... Oh, was that one when? Watershed Education Network? Yeah, or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. we took they're over. still, but they still operate out of Missoula. Okay. Um, well, they're, they're, but I don't They're know, not teaching, they're not super, teaching fun yeah, well. super fun, yeah, really. Yeah, um, this one was just, it wasn't super fun related, but I know I remember taking it, they came to our classroom. Yes, and it yeah. Was in Missoula, but it was like a yeah. bunch of schools. It was pretty big operation. So we hadn't, because I don't know if CFWIP had expanded by then. We'll see what you guys have. So. No, this was just in. Um, Very nice. I'm seeing some mountains and trees. Fish. Is your, you're copying Bill? Right. Great, see. Oh, very nice, Naomi. Is that, a, that's a river? Great, great, great. You're imagining it, it's cool. It's cool. Got it. We had this whole week long education where we go out and do this stuff and they teach us about it and then we actually go to the field and do it. But the day that that happened, I, that began that week, I broke both my arms, so I missed it. Whoa. Oh man. I missed it as a sixth grader. It was like the whole. Like, it's devastating. Year. We always look forward to this. No, just on a bike. Oh, oh weird. Oh, God. You made your kid come in. Landed like that. Oh. But, yeah, I just remember it because it wasn't mining related. It was a lot of just like nice. watershed repairing. It has well, I will be it, I will be honest, so I myself, because my interests are history and mining, I have brought a lot of that in. But the mining was there before as well. But I think okay, it was probably when watershed education program or something. Mm -hmm. It's probably when. So what I usually do then is we walk around and then I kind of talk about what I'm seeing in their pictures. Oh good, it's a fish. Or, and the kids are super nervous. They're like, oh my God, is this right? It's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't tell them anything and they get even more nervous. And very nice, Bill, very nice labeling, good, good. And so then we go to this slide and we say, we don't say anything if they're right or wrong. 
So then we say, okay, well many th people think that a watershed is a shed with water, right? Look at it, with that water running through. And about this time I say, because I've established, okay, I'm a biologist, and so about this time I say, do you think you would have a biologist or an engineer talking to you today? And how do you think we're gonna cover a whole week talking about a building with water? Which we probably could, but. So then I say, no, sorry, that's, that's not a shed with water. And then I start to say, okay, there's a couple definitions of shed, right? So there's shed the building, and then what's the other definition of shed? Yeah, like shedding clothing, shedding fur, we talk about like dogs or the mountains shedding water, anything like that. And so, like I said, we get, we also have them do a journal. This is part of our new like hands on minds on thing is we have them create this journal that's theirs and then, you know, they do this, right? But part of the thing too is we don't want them to like, I know we X'd it out in the previous slide, but we don't want them to do that. We want them to actually just relabel it. So we say, okay, why don't you just write, this is not a watershed and go to the next page, right? You can kind of see how she went to the next page and did mountains, okay? So then we tell them what a watershed is, right? So it's this area of land where all the water drains to the same stream, creek, or river. And then we have these little guys in there to remind them, this is important, we want you to journal this. So they add this into their journal, they write it down, and then we encourage them to draw. And they can draw whenever they want, the whole time, okay? So, is it working? <laughs> this is funny. I know that this yes. seems so insignificant, but the, we've never in 10 years had one person tell us that they knew what a watershed was. Never. This happened last spring. This was a moment. We were like, stop, we made it. I know, I know. We're getting up more since then. This was a big moment. This is how hard we worked. Um, the other kind of things that we took out of this was early and often. And I know that this is a thing in, in ed education that's sweeping the nation, but early and often. Um, a lot of kids we're seeing now just because of our different programs that we have going on, it's a lot of fun because we're seeing these kids like three and four and five times with just in Butte alone. And Helmville, I'm getting to know those kids a lot, all across the watershed. So that's the good thing is that they're, we're touching them a lot of times and so they're getting different information all of the time as well. Um, and then again, place-based, making sure that we take it to where they're at um, is really, really important. So these are some of the examples. I'm like speeding along here. These are some of the examples of the journals, right? So there's a lovely watershed. Um, we talk about the top evil five that were identified in the rod, right? Um, and we talk about how they, who they, you know, who they affect, the fish or the humans, and you know how much fish can withstand. Um, we also talk about the water on fire on the Cuyahoga River and what led to the Clean Water Act, you know, part of it. Um, we talk about healthy water for trout. Uh, riparian habitats is a big one we talk about. Also the three steps of mining. Um, and we talk about the three steps of mining because we talk about, again, how you know the waste rock was traditionally or historically piled up on the hill. Tailings were washed in the creek. And then smelting, right? That just went willy-nilly everywhere. Um, but then we also reiterate how this is very different nowadays. Okay, things are not this way. Um, and we, the other thing that we talk about that I think people miss um, sometimes is that we talk about how it's not just mining or the environment, right? We talk about and a lot. Um, and the, the place where I get them on this is I, talk, I ask them, I say, what do you guys think? Do you guys think mining's good or bad? We preload them with all the waste. Don't worry, I preload them really good. And then I say, okay, is mining bad? And it's getting to be really cool because when we first started that conversation, it was blatant, it's terrible, it's the worst. And now the last couple of years, we're getting a lot more kids that are like, no, I think, it's, I think it's both. I think we can do this both ways. And so then the way I get them all is, well, you're all sitting on a metal chair. How many of you got a ride to school with mom today or watch TV or flicked on the lights? Everyone, right? So it's and, we're all dependent on mining, right? And we're really technology driven. So it's an and relationship, okay? Um, so we make sure we hammer that one home. And we talk about, you know, like I said, we try to give them a lot of visual aids with restoration and remediation, because it's hard, it's a hard concept, I think, sometimes for kids. Um, and then the other messaging in there is 
the stewardship, right? That's part of our mis mission statement. We want the, I know, right? Isn't it beautiful? I hope I can do my part. <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. But we, we want them to do, we want them to walk away with this, that they can do something, okay? That they can do their part. They have all this information. They listen to us blab on for five days. I mean, can you imagine us for five days, right? It's kind of crazy. Um, you know, saying that they have all this information. They want to go out and inform people. That's great. We want them to do that, right? Um, and then this one's kind of long, but, you know, saying you're wonderful teachers. Great. Right? But no, but that they learned stuff, right? That they learned about bugs, that they named dissolved oxygen, that they knew what that was. This is a fifth grader. That's incredible that they know what these things are, right? So that's huge that they learned these things and that they're walking away with these things. And one of our biggest things, and again, how we're taking over the watershed is they go home at night and they tell their parents at the dinner table. Sometimes, not all the time, I realize, but sometimes they go home and talk to their folks about it. And that's cool because then. I get their parents at a meeting somewhere and they're like, hey, so you were talking about Johnny about this. Can I know about more about it? Yes, you can. Perfect. So that's one of the cool things. Um, the other thing is my call to action to you guys. How can you get involved in all of this? Um, we do have field trips every spring. That's that email I send out or I have Amanda Badavinick send it out saying, I need your help because sometimes I have like 80 kids on a field trip and us too. How's that gonna work? It's not gonna work. I need volunteers. Um, Cubs, this Clean Up Blacktail Stream event that we do every year. Um, Mr. I don't know if you guys know Lou Parrott at all. He was a local teacher and he started this actually back in the 70s um, on Blacktail. And so we've just kind of picked this back up with Lou's blessing, of course. Um, but this will be our fifth year of cleaning Blacktail and expanding onto Silverbow Creek. And Silverbow Creek, it's crazy how we've just barely, barely restored that thing, and it's a train wreck. People still view it as a dumping ground. I don't get it. Um, the fly fishing camp, right? That looked like lots of fun. It is. We always need volunteers for that. Uh, Breeze, which Chris talked to you guys about Breeze. Um, so we're always looking. That's a great experience for you guys. Um, that's a good way for you guys to get like a URP or a senior thesis out of that as well. Some of that stuff needs to be done. Um, and then we have all sorts of special events like Evil Knievel Days, Folk Festival. I, there's too many to name. There's lots. Um, and then mentorship. That's the other thing is that uh, Dr. A and I, because we adjunct with the biology department from time to time, we are available to help however we can with the ORPs or with senior thesis. Um, we helped that man back there, Ryan. We didn't scar him up too much. He's okay. He's, He's fine. He's, he made it. Um, some of the other current local restoration efforts that are going on are occurring in Browns Gulch and Blacktail Watershed. Um, this is kind of, Evan Norman talked a little bit about this stuff, but I just sat in on a meeting where the ranchers were like, we really need people to come out. We need help. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that need to happen, especially out in Browns Gulch. They need a lot of riparian fencing. They need willow plantings done, um, maintenance of their current projects. Um, and then they need to work on it, more beaver mimicry installation and monitoring. That is like a senior thesis project right there waiting to happen. Wait, just waiting, it's prime for the picking, okay? She is, Norjuan is like waiting for that. Um, and then if you recall, right, that's that installation there. Um, so there's Norjahan's contact information for Brown's Gulch. Like I said, she is like dying to have students come out and work on these projects with her. Um, and then Amy Chadwick and Evan with are working on Blacktail End. And there's also stuff to be done there for sure. So this is like all 700 people to thank on our super fun site. There's a lot in this room. And there's me as a scientist. Any questions? <laughs>